studies coming from my undergraduate degree at Cornell University. And so um, if every, anyone is interested in talking more, I'd be really interested in uh, talking to you more about um, kind of synergies with my uh, lab and lab and my information and, and office number is down below. And so a lot of my work really bridges between hydrology and biogeochemistry to understand the responses of natural systems and watersheds to anthropogenic changes. And so um, one of my real kind of fundamental research missions in my lab is to really understand the fundamental interactions between soil and hydrological and biogeochemical processes in regulating transport and retention of carbon and nitrogen. And then really understand the ways in which land use and other human altered changes are altering those processes and their interactions. And then really integrating human dimensions and social processes into our understanding of how we can basically manage ecosystems and also their structure and function. And so a lot of my work has really um, kind of crossed and really looks at that, that interaction between the biogeochemistry and hydrology and really taken on projects, for example, in my dissertation research, looking at nitrogen deposition in tropical forests to land use in um, southern Arizona to um, looking at how climate change will affect the hydrology and how that will influence the biogeochemistry. And more recently, I'm looking at the effects of fire on both the hydrology, but also the biogeochemistry. And so some of my current projects um, in particular have been over the last seven years working on the Reynolds Creek Critical Zone Observatory, of which I'm the director for. And unfortunately, that uh, program is coming to an end. And so the degree and the award is ending in 2001. But this program has really sought to really explore the critical zone and really describing that critical zone as the top of the canopy to the bottom of the groundwater and looking at how um, basically these different um, components, the biosphere, the hydrosphere, the lithosphere, and the atmosphere really shape that real thin skin um, of the earth, that breathing um, skin of the earth. And so really um, trying to incorporate kind of deeper time scales and spatial scales um, that really reflects the integration more of um, geological perspectives. And so um, really looking at that entire unconsolidated material or what we describe as the regolith, um, looking at these those deeper time scales, as I mentioned, like more eons and looking at the, um, the effects of different anthropogenic changes or disturbances on, for example, soil formation. Um, and then looking at more complex terrain, traditionally soil scientists have really looked at um, really flat surfaces and tried to control for erosion um, with really good, you know, for good reason. But um, the critical zone science has really taken us up and um, allowed us to integrate and look at more complex terrain on slope terrain by interacting and collaborating with geomorphologists. And so some of the questions that we've been asking over the past couple of years have been, you know, how does topography and regolith properties, for example, control the distribution of soil carbon in um, microbial communities? And so we've really um, approached this with some pretty simple kind of hypotheses about soil carbon varying with aspect owing to difference in microclimate, soil carbon varying uh, with curvature owing to differences in thickness with potentially um, more concave uh, soil hill slopes containing more soil carbon and more convex uh, soil surfaces on the hill slopes containing less carbon. And um, working with graduate students Nick Patton, um, Sarah Godsey, and um, Ben Crosby here at um, Idaho State University, we've really shown that curvature can be a strong predictor of soil thickness to saprolite or that depth of the mobile regolith. And um, this is, uh, we've been, we've also shown that this is a general relationship. Um, and that, and so if you would ask me five years ago, if I could predict the soil thickness um, across a watershed, I would have said, no way, Jose. Um, and, but now I would say, wow, if you give me some information um, in terms of like the LIDAR or the a general, um, uh, 
a very fine resolution DEM, we might be able to actually estimate soil thickness and its distribution across a watershed um, with some pretty simple relationships. And so here we show that curvature is a linear, um, a mobile regolith is a linear function of curvature. We were able to also look at um, soil carbon using this relationship and we were able to explain about 91% of that variation in the total carbon in that soil profile with, within a catchment. And so um, again, allowing us to basically estimate our soil carbon across a very complex area, um, but using simple relationships of relating curvature to total organic carbon in that profile, and then basically also separating it out based on whether it's a north and a south facing aspect, because we indeed showed really strong aspect effects. And so some of these findings also really showed that there are really large quantities of carbon at depth. And so this just shows you kind of an example of some of the maps that we've been creating showing these three meter resolution of soil carbon maps um, and distributing that carbon across the landscape. And so um, we've also been looking at um, microbial distributions within those deeper soil profiles. And as a part of the, the CZO project, we did some comparisons across um, a number of different sites in, the, um, in this CZO program. And um, we just recently uh, published some papers looking at both the microbial uh, distributions with depth, but also um, enzymatic activities with depth. And um, that's the Brewer et al. and Dove et al. paper and basically showing um, real strong differences between the different sites. And in some cases, um, showing really relatively uniform distribution of diversity of microbial communities with depth. So for example, if you look to the right, showing that Reynolds and also the Southern Sierras have instances and also the Hemis River Basin examples where we have relatively uniform distributions of microbes. And so uh, recently we just got funded on another five year project to look at um, five sites, five study sites across the United States, instrument sites with soil pits and, and instrument soil pits with um, CO2 probes and oxygen probes, and then look at the microbes and biogeochemistry now seasonally and with depth to really understand questions related to kind of what is the role of climate versus lithology and controlling those uh, distributions of microbial uh, communities and their functions. And I didn't start my timer, so I'm gonna just keep on going until I get turned off. Um, and so, um, other questions that we've been asking in my lab is how do how does climate and disturbance control lateral export of carbon and nutrient fluxes? How does climate and lithology control stream intermittency and chemistry? And then how does fire influence these processes? And then finally, as I mentioned, we're really looking at uh, from the top of the canopy to the bottom of the groundwater, what is the residence time and controls on storage of carbon and water in, in that groundwater? And so um, we've just recently uh, completed and submitted a paper. Um, Kayla Glossner was a graduate student in biology and we submitted a manuscript uh, basically hind casting, looking at um, sediment, uh, suspended sediment yields over 25 years from the Reynolds Creek Critical Zone Observatory shown on the top panel from five watersheds. And then we also were able to hind cast basically particulate organic carbon yields over those 25 years, basically deriving functional relationships between suspended sediment and particulate organic carbon. And so this is a really unique um, data set that we've been able to compile. And really also um, along the way, um, we had a fire in the Reynolds Creek. So we were able to look at the role of fire, for example, influencing um, these particulate organic carbon export and also sediment export. And really showing that we um, that fire increased sediment and carbon transport by one to two orders of magnitude. Um, we've been also looking at some um, issues in the Reynolds Creek related to 
uh, strain intermittency and its effects on spatial um, complexity and strain chemistry. And I'm not going to give away um, the storyline. I'll just say that Ruth McNeil here in uh, biology is going to be defending her thesis um, on November 5th at noon. And I really hope for folks to um, attend that defense and um, and support her and so and see her results. And so um, I'm just going to give that little um, plug for Ruth. And then um, just say that as um, Rebecca mentioned, we have this new project that's starting up. Um, it's called the Ames Project and it's across a number of different institutions and um, Gibson Jack and then um, some stream in Reynolds Creek. Um, and so that project will kind of continue some of this work that we've already started at Reynolds Creek and really, really look at those linkages uh, between stream intermittency, biogeochemistry, and microbiomes. So with that, I'll just take uh, questions. Thank you so much, Kitty. That was wonderful. All right, any, any questions for any of our speakers? Okay. Well, with that, I want to I want to thank our four speakers today. We started out with Dr. Rebecca Hale, followed by Dr. David Delhanti, Dr. Charles Peterson, and Dr. Kathleen Losey. Thank you all to all of our speakers and thank you to our audience for attending. See you next time. Thanks for moderating this, Josh. Of yeah, course. Thank you. Yeah. Sure thing.